Good afternoon. Good afternoon. It's my pleasure to introduce our speaker, Dr. Daryl M. Scott, professor of history at Howard University. Born and raised in Chicago, Dr. Scott came of age during the civil rights and black power era. After serving in the military, he attended Marquette University in Milwaukee, Wisconsin, and Stanford University in Palo Alto, California, where he received his doctorate in history in 1994. He began his teaching career at Columbia University in New York City and left there in 2000 to serve as director of African American Studies at the University of Florida at Gainesville. Since 2003, he has been professor of history at Howard University, serving as chair from 2005 to 2009. Among the many associations to which he belongs, the first and foremost is the Association for the Study of African American Life and History, ASALA. He has served on its board since 2003 and is currently its president. Founded by Carter G. Woodson in 1915, ASALA is the oldest black scholarly and intellectual society in the world. Much of Dr. Scott's work has involved reinvigorating ASALA's programs, including its annual meeting and publications. In 2009, he headed the effort to take the association's scholarly publications into the digital age. In 2012, he teamed with Marilyn Thomas Houston to found and serve as co-editor of a new peer-reviewed scholarly publication entitled FIRE, the Multimedia Journal of Black Studies, which is on JSTOR's platform. It is his hope that FIRE will keep ASALA a vital part of the intellectual life of both African Americans and the nation well into the next century. Dr. Scott is also the author of Contempt and Pity, Social Policy and the Image of the Damaged Black Psyche, 1880 to 1996. It's a great honor to welcome our keynote speaker, Dr. Daryl M. Scott. Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. Good afternoon. You know, sometimes you forget your own biography. It was is the mic working? I don't think so. Let's do another shot here. There we go. Oh. And of course, now I'm going to get the feedback, right? <laughs> but you almost forget your own biography. I'd forgotten that when I was a student at Marquette in 1982, one of the first things I did as a student leader was participate in a movement for justice for someone killed by the police, a guy named Ernie Lacey, and that was in 1982. And I'm to understand that you've come together as a community around a very similar event some, I guess, 25, 30 years later. And it seems that our problems don't go away. But before I get too far down the road, I want to thank you for inviting me here, Many Voices, One Community, I understand that you're an outgrowth of, if you will, an effort to overcome and to grapple with the problems that came out of that killing and that the government saw fit to bring the community together and now that you, you as concerned citizens are trying to keep alive this notion of how to bring about justice for everybody who's a citizen of this community. So you're to be commended because you've been at this a lot longer than most people have. Most people find this issue along the way and drop this issue before too long. So that you're sticking in, sticking in with this problem could, you know, speaks well of you as a community. Now, I must say, despite my having been involved with the movement for justice for Ernie Lacey when I was an undergraduate, I'm no different from anyone else in this society. I started pretending that justice was part and parcel of what was happening in America as if I did not know or have any sense of history or any background to what was going on in day-to-day -day life. There's a way in which we background the injustice that we know that's taking place and perhaps we do it so that we can continue 
with our lives without being constantly interrupted. We normalize these things and try to pretend that we won't be victims of them. You see, it's easier for us to see evil when we're looking through the rearview mirror. And as a historian, I know that all too well because now as a society, we're willing to cop plea to slavery, we're willing to cop plea to Jim Crow, and soon I get the sense that we'll be willing to cop a plea to even mass incarceration. But we tend to find the evil in retrospect as opposed to seeing the evil for what it is when it's before us. And I want to say that I, I am a, a supporter of the Black Lives Matter movement. I don't come here as a disinterested scholar. I don't pretend that. Sometimes I, I will pose as a disinterested person. But I come here as one who's a fan of the movement. I'm a fan of the movement precisely because I find the young folks courageous. Now, there's a lot of people who critique black millennials. I don't critique them if for no other reason I am the father of two black millennials. And I'm not in the business of dissing my children. But at the same time, they're grown folks now, and I'm not in the business of patronizing my grown children. And so I respect what they're bringing to this struggle, this struggle that I did not solve for them, that we collectively, we older folks, did not solve for them. We have given them the struggle that we failed to take on. And I'd like to talk about this and make three points today. That this movement, this Black Lives Matter movement, is trying to tackle that age-old problem of extrajudicial violence against people of African descent. This age-old problem. And I want to make the point that the movement comes from outside of the mainstream of the black community. And a lot of people have problems with it for that reason. And I'm here to say, when you think about the African-American protest tradition, you will soon discover that the folks who wage the protests tend to be people from outside of the mainstream of the African-American experience. And then third, I'm here to say to those critics of the Black Lives Matters movement, those critics who really do believe in social justice, those critics who basically are saying that they're sellouts, that they don't represent anything in the black community, I simply say to them, I challenge you to do what they've done to have the courage to stand up and fight the good fight, no matter how difficult it is, no matter how long it takes. Indeed, ladies and gentlemen, the struggle against extra legal violence in America goes back all the way to the plantation. Ironically, under slavery, the masters had legal authority. Legal authority to punish slaves. The slave patrols had legal authority to punish slaves. People forget that part. And vigilantism was not a big part of the system because the slave power actually controlled much of the society. So extra legal, extra judicial violence existed precisely because the planner was given the power to inflict punishment outside of a judicial system. Outside of the judicial system. That the slave patrol could summarily inflict violence, the limits being placed on the limits of what planners would allow to happen to their property. And so this is an age-old system, but yet the worst part did not come under slavery. And I don't want to minimize, and I got lots of colleagues with whom I argue about this matter, but anyone who wants to talk about the value of human life would say the slaves did not have value as human life. But as African Americans became free, 
when they were supposed to have the value of human life. They did not get their freedom with their full measure of value. Because it's at that moment that the value of black life ceased to be based on property and became based on the perceptions of whites in the society. And it's at that particular moment that black life became cheap. We as a country have statistics for lynching. We can tell you, even if the numbers are not accurate, how lynching rose and declined in our society. But we cannot tell you, we cannot tell you about another phenomenon, which is just extra judicial killings that were not lynchings. We cannot tell you about that. Now what do I mean? I mean to say in the late 19th century South, whites who killed blacks for whatever reason were often not held accountable. And most of those killings did not take place at the hands of the Klan. These were just casual killings that people would engage in. I've seen documents in which one white would bet another white that they can hit them, this black person from 300 or 500 yards away with a rifle. I'm a better shot than you. And just simply shoot and kill someone without there ever being a coroner's inquest. This happened all frequently, certainly not that circumstance, but the notion that you did not have to stand a day in front of a judge, a day in front of, of your peers, and, 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 and account for your behavior. It's part and partial of it. The fact that no one had to issue a death certificate for most people of African descent when they died is part and partial of it. Black life all of a sudden became something that did not have its proper value, even as property. Now, ladies and gentlemen, things changed in a very bizarre way when formalized Jim Crow comes in the early, late 19th, early 20th century. Because all of a sudden, the vigilantism that existed in Southern society started declining. And increasingly, the sheriff became, had a monopoly on extrajudicial violence. The sheriff began to loom large in our imaginations precisely because of the demobilizations of the white masses under segregation. Some people who were reformers argued that segregation would reduce that kind of violence, and over time, the number of lynchings did start to decline. And over time, the white masses ceased to be the ones who were primarily responsible for keeping the Negro in his or her place. But that story is a Southern story. On the other hand, urbanization into the big cities came with it, a more impersonal style of policing, and increasingly the violence between blacks and the police just became a normal feature of life. There, in every virtually every city that you read about, we know about police brutality being part and partial of that experience. Going back to the early 20th century, we know it for a fact. And we know that in 19, the 1930s, the nature of riots changed. Riots before 19, the 1930s were pretty much pogroms in which black people were killed by whites. And then all of a sudden there were riots in which black people started fighting back. But by the 1930s, riots became understood increasingly as something that took place in the aftermath of a police killing, aftermath of police brutality. And so this problem that we're talking about has a history that in its own right is a hundred years old without any debate. And when we, we look at the riots of the 1960s in Detroit started out of such an incident. Harlem's riots started out of such an incident. 
We know how this story goes. Most of us have, how many people remember the riot of 1982 in Miami? The Miami riot of 19, another one of those riots that comes straight out of a police killing. So police killings and riots go hand in hand. And so I find it ironic that when people want to explain riots today in the wake of a police killing, people will invoke the, back, the, the notion of the black family structure. When nobody argues that the black family was deteriorated in 1935 or 1945, but all of a sudden it applies in 19, uh, well, ever, since 65 on. And I make this point all the time. If deteriorated families explain riots, then why don't we see the Hispanic community with 60 some percent of their children born on wedlock engage, quote unquote, wedlock born engaged in riots? And I'd like to drop this bomb on everybody. The magic number, the tipping point, was understood to be 25%. And here we are today with the white family, single parenthood, being at 25%. And we don't see white people rioting all over. So whatever the cause of riots, it doesn't have anything to do with family structure. It has nothing to do. It is bad social science, period. The riot thesis is wrong when it's tied to anybody's family. Yes, there's something to be explained. But I would suggest to you the explanation for black rioting is actually born out of the protest tradition of African Americans. Since 2005, ladies and gentlemen, one might argue that we have been living with a regime of what I call vigilante empowerment laws. Vigilante empowerment laws. There's a way in which the 2000 aughts are equivalent to the 1890s in this sense. Most people who lived in the 1890s did not see what was coming. Most people did not see Plessy versus Ferguson as something that was going to dramatically change their lives. Most people didn't fully understand that disfranchisement in Mississippi in 1890 was going to change everything about black voting in America. And I suggest to you that many of us did not understand that in 2005, when the Stand Your Ground law was passed in Florida, that it would transform the relationships between black citizens, white citizens, and brown citizens all over again. I would suggest to you that in a multi-ethnic, multi-racial society, I don't say black and white, in a multi-ethnic, multi-racial society, you, you surely should not start going down the path of saying people can solve their problems by using guns in public. It's a very bad move. You do not want Hispanics and blacks in LA solving their problems between them that way. You do not want Korean store owners or Korean citizens in the city at large solving that problem that way in black communities. You do not want to travel the roads of America and get off the road because you just might land in my county, Prince George's County, which is predominantly African American. And our juries tend to be predominantly African American. And maybe we should stand our ground. In a multi-ethnic, multi-racial society, stand your ground laws are really dangerous. And people who see it as black and white are fooling themselves. But we also had the open carry laws. And if open carry laws were fair, ladies and gentlemen, we would not have Tamir Rice as a dead 12 year old in Ohio because Ohio has open carry laws. John Crawford, who was killed in Ohio at a Walmart because he had picked up 
a gun that was legally for sale. And if it was, was his own gun, he had the right to have it in an open carry state. And yet he is killed on sight. Open carry laws don't work out for anyone. Well, and by the way, stand your ground laws work out worse for black people, but only 17% of whites who invoke it actually succeed at it either. So basically, open, uh, stand your ground laws are laws that would get you put in jail, and it's a bad law that feeds into people's fears. It's not a solution to anybody's problems. Now, this is the background to a set of events that really dramatized and changed our response to things. You know, there were some of us who predicted that after President Obama left office, that there would be a new social movement in America. And everybody used to marvel at what kind of good behavior black people had <laughs> since the president's been in office. <laughs> everybody said, yeah, but you know, when he's out of office, there's some things that we need to address. And all of a sudden, we start finding ourselves increasingly saying, you know, things are really not fair. And I think we all know the moment when it really crystallized to us, and that is when Trayvon Martin was killed in Florida by George Zimmerman. We knew at that moment things were different. And it was at that moment that people looking at this matter, particularly when Zimmerman got off, started saying, we must do something. And increasingly, you saw people do something, trying to imitate the Arab Spring, and they were gonna tweet their way to freedom. People took the social media, took the Facebook, took the Twitter, and they started tweeting about everything. There was supposed to be a big boycott of Florida, blah, 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 blah. But you will never tweet your way to freedom. Social media is not going to set you free. It is simply a means of communication. And in every case that I know of, the people who win the day in social struggle are the people who are organized. Do you think for one moment the people in the Arab Spring, particularly in Egypt, would have tweeted their way to try to treat their, tweet their way to freedom if they had known the repression that was about to come their way, if they knew the groups who were more organized than they were, who were ready and poised to take power? Do you think for one half second whether the people in Syria would have gone up against that regime by using social media if they had thought it would come to this? Who would have thought this? But yet, ladies and gentlemen, this is what happens to unorganized people who think they can go up against duly constituted authority. And yet, out of this moment of Trayvon Martin's being killed and George Zimmerman getting off, there were some people on social media who created a hashtag, Black Lives Matter. It's a very simple hashtag. And their success is due in part of the utter brilliance of the hashtag itself. It just simply, at one hand, is provocative. On the other hand, it's just so plain and simple. I won't go through the long thing I used to do. I'll just simply say, as our president said, it does not deny that other people's lives matter. It's an insistence that it's too obvious to miss that black lives have been devalued and that black lives also matter. And so when Alicia Garza sent out this tweet, other people responded. And I'm gonna skip some because I don't have as much time as I thought, but look, one of the, well, no, no, one of the most important things, I'm going to I'm gonna get right to it. 
What makes this important to me is that this group of women, and we're talking about women, decided that they were going to organize themselves and others and the first thing they did, not the first thing, one of the first things they did was claim that hashtag. And I got some academic friends who are radical who didn't like that they claimed their hashtag. They claimed their hashtag, they got in front of media, they made videos of it and they said we did this. And we weren't talking about people who were in a sense, you see, there's a myth of, in movements about leadership that comes out of the 60s and I spent a lot of my career arguing against. This myth of leaderless movements, this myth that everybody's a leader, this myth that there's never structure and pecking orders involved in how you succeed or fail, this myth is what ruined Occupy Democracy. This myth has killed more movements that I've been involved in in my career. The movements that succeed are the movements in which people step up and take responsibility. We're not talking about being authoritarian. We're not talking about being anti-democracy. We're talking about leadership and people stepping up and owning what they're doing and taking serious themselves as people who organize to bring about change. Holding leaders accountable. You see, if nobody's in charge, then nobody's accountable inside the movement or outside the movement. You have to be organized. And so when I saw them step up, and claim their hashtag. When I saw them with a willingness, with unwillingness to organize with people from across the country who that they did not know so well, this told me that they were gonna organize on a basis of openness. On a basis of openness that they weren't gonna sit there and shiver and try to figure, like many groups do, who's a member of the federal government's FBI? Who's a member of this party and that party? Oh, some of you have been through all this before. I know you have. You, I, yeah, you've been there. You've done that. And these young people were still willing to meet with people and some of them had been in movements before had been part of struggle before and they were willing to do this and I sat back watching my social media and I said Black Lives Matter I've been rolling with them ever since <laughs> I've been rolling with them ever since ain't met one of them in fact know some that they're part of the association well I met one of them I know a few of them but the point is I watched them carry on their struggle I don't agree with most things that they do. You hear that? I don't agree with most things, but I agree with the fundamentals of what they're doing and I agree with what they stand for. You see, they themselves identify themselves with movements past. In a way, they try to deny that they're not their grandparents' movement, but they are their grandparents' movement. They forgot that they had two sets of grandparents. They're, no, they're not the movement from the NAACP side of the house, but they do believe in nonviolence still. They're the movement more or less from the black power side of the house, even though they have not taken to killing and shooting policemen. Okay? But they believe in a black consciousness that we haven't seen for a while. They believe in people like Asada, Asada and Angela Davis, women from the past movements. They see the continuity there. They believe in Ella Baker and the principles she stood for. So they believe in things that are tried and true in our history. But then there's this issue, the issue that keeps stalking their movement. And that's this issue that they are LGBTQ. And that royals a lot of people. That royals a lot of people. Now I want to assure you, I 
I've evolved on some issues in my lifetime. And that's why I think we all need children. Because your children make you look at yourself in the mirror. And when my daughter got of the age of criticism, <laughs> that was around about five or six for her. <laughs> when she got of that age of critiquing her father, she looked at me askance. And I'm not, I'm not, I'm not putting all that on film. <laughs> but she made me look in the mirror. And it wasn't a brutal statement on my behalf, nor was it a kind of big slap down from her. I could see that she felt uncomfortable with how I was handling issues. And I believe in self-check. Let me, in these few minutes, run this down to you. Get to the brass tacks of this matter. Explain one thing I want you to walk away with this room from. There is in my humble estimation as an intellectual a reason why this movement emphasizes anti-respectability politics. In other words, they hate that respectability thing. And it has to do more, or should we say, it has to do with much more than the black history of struggle. Change in black history has often come from outsiders. The African American churches were built by people who were not trying to recreate Africa in America, but by the people who were most acculturated. Yeah, let the truth be told. African religions did not survive as such. And I know there was Islam in the antebellum America. I understand that. But when freedom came, we did not see the visible mosque, right? invisible mosque take form. These churches were built by people who had become acculturated and the mo those who were most assimilated in the north built these churches that we know of today and brought them south, many of them that, that weren't indigenous to the south. You gotta own that. There were Africans in New York, we know by their markings. There were Muslims in New York and everywhere else, we know this. But these people on the margins built these institutions, most of them, many of them that we talk about today. During Reconstruction, the leadership often came from outside of the local population. Oh yeah, oh yeah. And to cut it to the quick, Black Lives Matter is at once internal to the community, but yet they're on the margins. And LBGTQ people are on the margins. And all of their lives, all of their lives, they have been fighting against mainstream notions of respectability. To be gay in America is to be disreputable. And it's their community that has paid a disproportionate price at the hands of the police. Okay? We all know what happens to people who are transvestites. We know trans people are often killed by everybody in this society because they don't conform to our way of life. They are disreputable by definition. They are anti-respectable. So this movement of black women, this movement of people who are gay and lesbians and trans and queer. This movement led by these people has another dimension that I find more wholesome than anything else I see. It is a movement that is not centered on themselves per se. It is a movement in which they are universalizing the notion that everybody should be treated with the dignity and respect of human beings.
Just think about that for a moment. They're saying to the rest of us that all lives matter. The most profound thing that they don't say per se is that LBGT lives matter. They say it in what they're doing. Think about what we're witnessing here. A movement by a group of people who are wrapping themselves into the, in the most fundamental of ideas and universalizing them in a fundamental way. And yes, they are insisting that they too should be treated with the same dignity and respect that all humans should have. They're claiming no right that they're not offering everybody else. And they're fighting an issue that no other generation solved. What generation has solved the extrajudicial killings and beatings of black people? What generation has solved it for white people? In fact, white people in this country have tended to be more than willing to allow white people to die so that black people can be policed. Think about what really happens. We know white people don't get killed by police like this in the whitest countries of Europe. And the people who say that white people get killed more than black people, yes, they get killed in greater numbers. We're talking percentages, but why do you allow it? Why do you allow people who are citizens no different from you to lord over you. I watched a video the other day and we all know this, these cameras is what really has broken this game through. I watched a young man, we didn't see the person being shot, we saw the encounter. A young white person killed, for, for my, to my mind, no good reason. No gun whatsoever. We allow this because of our fears of people who are perceived to be outside of respectability. And so that even white lives have been cheapened. And Booker T. Washington, and I'll close on this note, Booker T. Washington, one of those great advocates of respectability, would even say, don't let anyone else pull you into the gutter with them. And I'm here to tell you, I'm sorry to say, white people have, in a way, pulled themselves in a gutter. They have cheapened their own lives in an effort to address their unreasonable fears of other people in this society. And it's up to the Black Lives Matter movement to give us all the proper value on our lives. Thank you. I haven't looked at, okay, I'm a little bit over. Is, is there any time for questions? I will take two. Okay. <laughs> Anyone have a burning question? Ashley. Um, yes. I don't necessarily know how to ask this or if you can answer it, but uh, in some of my classes lately I've been asking students, I've been discussing social problems and then asking students how they would fix those problems. Mm -hmm. And they kind of just sit there. And, and then I try to ask them, basically I get to the point of, do, do you care about these problems? And mm -hmm. I wonder if you have any thoughts on how to make people care about things that they may perceive as not directly affecting them. You know, that is a hard one. I, I, it, you know, it is hard. We all want to carry on, right, with our daily lives. And we do. We, we do carry on with our daily lives. Even when, even during war, I'm struck with the fact that the average citizen in a war-torn country carries on with his or her daily life. But the mission is always at one level or another about education. 
And, and of course, we as educators, those of us who are in the classroom, that's what we're doing there. But I really do believe that it does have some impact when you get people to think about their values. When you get people to think about what it is they believe, okay? You know, one of the things I didn't get a chance to say is that lynching starts declining. And it was not because anybody succeeded in a law against lynching. And, in a, and even today, we all can say that people in this country do not value lives properly. But I'm enough a histor of a historian to say that the value of life everywhere in this country somehow went up between 1920 and 1945. That is not where anybody would want it to be. And those changes, that societal change, is a part, product of our experiences. And I really do believe not just social media has a way of circulating things. And I'm just here to tell you, over time, a lot of stuff is going to start looking backwards to people as the images that we share start sinking into the consciousness, particularly of rising, the rising generation. And I'm not here to believe that history goes in one direction. I really do believe that the sensibilities will be awakened on a certain set of issues, just like they have been. Mass incarceration is probably about over. A lot of things come together on that one, okay? Gay marriage happened because some things came together on that one. My daughter straightened me out, okay? And these things do happen. And so we keep, we don't know the day when it reaches somebody. We know it doesn't reach everybody at once. We know some people will never be reached. But yet we see change because it takes place at that level. Yes. Um, I grew up pretty in a diverse mm -hmm. area population, and now that I've moved to Virginia, I hear a lot of older generations say that they believe that integration was not a good thing, and that's a huge debate. I just wanted to know what was your take on that. <sighs> It's complicated, but I'll, I'll just put it out here. We're one of the few societies in which people believe ethnicity will not be with you. We're one of the few societies in which people believe that ethnicity disappears. I'm always struck when people talk about things in Iraq and you find various religions and cultures living together, even when you thought it was all Sunni and Shia, and you find out that there's just this wide array of groups living amongst the Muslims. And the same in most places in the world. But only in America do we believe that there was not going to be ethnicity. Why should I assume that Jamaicans who migrate to America after 1965, why should I assume they'll have no affinity to, for other Jamaicans? Why should I assume that? Because we believe in America, we melt everybody. But let me ask you another question. Where do people melt in the land in which they as a people came into being? You don't expect to, the Irish to melt in Ireland. You don't expect the Italians to melt in Italy. Mm -hmm. And to my Afrocentric friends who are going to say, uh oh, you're not going to say that, why would you expect African Americans who as a group have a collective identity born in America to disappear before your eyes in America? Why would you expect that? And we know that when people melt in America, they tend to melt within their racial groupings and become a racial group. You become an Asian American in America. Right? You become a white American in America. And yet, 
that ethnic identity is not as strong because it does not have the same history I, except in the South, and that's why I get in trouble with my Southern historian friends when I say Southerners are an ethnic group, not just a cultural group. And that some of them have assimilated out of the Southern identity, and those are usually the ones I'm talking to, who would be so generous as to say there's a such thing as a black Southerner, when real Southerners would say Blacks can be Southern like the flora and fauna, but they can't be Southerners. That's a debate that academics don't acknowledge because those Southerners, ethnic Southerners, don't have the university professorships in the right departments. <laughs> Am I right or wrong? I know, I know, I know. Don't speak to it, I know. <laughs> but anyway, that's, that's my answer. People tend not to melt in most countries. Ethnic groups born in a place tend not to melt in a place. Immigrants come here, they, they don't understand it that way. They see themselves coming here quite often to make a little money and go back home. They melt kicking and screaming, but they melt nonetheless. Okay? I, a lot of sociologists in here, I know I can get in trouble. <laughs> Okay. Right, Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.